Hey, welcome to our YouTube. We're about to listen to a message from our church here in Hillsong, Denmark. Make sure to comment below, like, subscribe, or even share with a friend, and stick around afterwards for different ways to connect. So good. Hey, thank you for being here today. Um, you know, the focus today is Easter lily, the flowers, and um, you know, which is all about new life, new things springing forth. And uh, today, like George said, um, it's a bit of a mixture because, you know, being a local church pastor is, I'm getting you standing. That's okay. I'm about to stay in the next, you know, two hours while you're listening to me. That's a joke. Um, but, and also a big welcome to Aarhus as well. So can we give a massive welcome here from Copenhagen to Hillsong Aarhus? Simon and I were over there yesterday uh, as we were launching our faith mission partners. But... You know, being a local church pastor, I was thinking about this morning, the two biggest challenges I find in being up here preaching and preparing for today is the first one is you speak to kind of the same people every Sunday, you know, and, you know, that's a challenge in itself is that you're speaking to the same people every single week. That's one thing. And um, is that Mike I'm seeing up there? Hello, sir. Good to see you. Do you think you could sneak in like that? Amazing. So good. Um, that's one thing, uh, that, not that Mike is here, that it's the challenge that you speak to the same people and you know, you're coming up with new ways of saying the same thing. And the other side as well is finding the balance between you know, bringing the Word of God but also leading church and you know, using this platform to go, you know, there is something so sacred about this platform as we bring the Word of God. But at the same time, standing here as a local church pastor and going, you know, what are the cultures and what are the focus and what is the mission and vision and where are we at as a church? And uh, we're about to pray now because today I need to find the balance between the trap is set. Uh, we need to find the balance between those two of me bringing the word today, but also just bringing some leadership of where we are at as a church. Is that okay? Uh, and that is what heart and soul is all about. So let's pray and, um, and then we're going to get into this. So Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege it is, again, of being in your house. Lord, we don't want to take these moments for granted. We thank you, God, that... You are not an, a God who is on autopilot. You are a present God. You are near God. You are close to every single one of us. Even the person here that feels the furthest away, that feels the most disqualified. Lord, I thank you that we are not qualified because of our doings. We're qualified because of the blood of the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can have full confidence as we step into your presence. Lord God, knowing that we are accepted, that we are loved, we are included, Lord Jesus. And I just pray for the next few minutes. May you speak through me like I believe you've spoken to me, Lord God. And I pray that when we leave this place, may we leave not just more in love with you, but also in love with your house, love with your church, Lord God, that you said that you want to build. So we commit this time to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we get to do this in the name of Jesus. If you believe you can say amen. 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 Why don't you give two people a high five before you sit down? Amazing. And can we thank the creative team as well? You guys are incredible. Thank you, 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 and thank you. So good. And um, I think um, someone needs to write this down, George or events or someone. Next Sunday, we are going to, as if from tonight, we're going to put some prompts on the screen for our one-minute mingle. Just some questions you can ask your neighbor. Okay, um, I've had a few of you write to me a DM on Instagram, I don't know if you're here today, of just going, I hate that moment. Uh, you extroverts might love it, but I hate it. And um, so, <laughs> so that's why you join Creative, because just to get out of that moment. And so what we're going to do as of tonight, we're going to put prompts, like call this Church Chat GPT. We're going to put some prompts on the screen. Just some questions, you can just go, I'm going to use that question with my neighbor. Is that okay? Who reckons that's a good idea? Okay, we're all the introverts that love that. Do you know if you're going to put up your hand because you're an introvert? That's great. So good. Hey, um, the, the message uh, today, uh, Heart and Soul, really, um, it used to be a midweek event, Heart and Soul. Heart and Soul was just an opportunity. Uh, we don't really like do general for something, or, like, you know, annual uh, meetings for the members, but we have these m moments once a quarter. Well, we just gather the church, those who call Hillsong home, where we just give it like a bit of a stock take, where we at as a church, where we at, you know, in our culture, where we at in our strength, in our capacity, in our finances, across the board, 
And uh, in the past, we've done those midweek. But really, we're trying, to, we're trying to peel away events, you know, and really just, just c continue focusing on building community and, 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 and being part of each other's worlds in terms of fellowship and discipleship. And so what we, what we decided, I think it was last year, was just to have a Sunday where we find the balance between bringing the word but also giving a bit of an update of where we are as a church. And so today is a heart and soul Sunday. It's for those who call Hillsong home. And uh, my message is just called Heart and Soul. Um, what is it called? It's Heart and Soul, Mission versus Motion. Mission versus Motion. I wonder, have you ever said to some, something to someone um, and then maybe before you said it, you were like, oh, I don't know if I can say this because you, maybe you were afraid um, or you thought that maybe the relationship wasn't strong enough for you to say what you wanted to say. Has anyone ever been in that situation? Maybe you wanted to confront someone or maybe someone asked for your opinion. That one is the worst. What do you think about this? They're asking for your feedback and then you're like, like really? Like, do you really want to know? <laughs> like, you know, one of the keys that you get told as a communicator and you get told as a preacher is never ask a question you are not sure the answer is going to be. <laughs> it's like, are you loving church today? And normally if you don't get the right answer, you just keep asking it until you get the answer you want. But, you know, like you have those moments where you're like, oh, can I really say what I want to say because I don't know what to do if the relationship isn't strong enough for this confrontation. I've often said to communicators and leaders and pastors that you can only confront in accordance with the strength of the relationship. Meaning, when you think about a relationship with someone, the, 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 the tie that is binding you, the tie that is, that is between you, think of it as a bridge, okay? And the strength of that bridge will determine what you can bring across. You can't, dri you can't drive a tank over an old wooden bridge. <laughs> you know, if you want to confront big you've got to make sure there is a strong relationship, that there is a strong bridge. A couple of months ago, I gave a question to the whole church uh, that I wanted everyone to ask themselves, and I'll, I'll ask again today, and that is, what will I do when I get offended? What will I do when I get offended? In life, what will I do when I get offended by friends? What will I do when I get offended by my work? What will I do when I get offended by, by God? Can we say that? What will I do when I get offended by family? What will I do when I get offended by church? What will I do when I get offended by the preacher? <laughs> what will I do? We cannot, church, we cannot be on a learning journey together as a community without at some point we're going to hit some areas in our lives that mean a lot to us and that we can feel offense that you are even addressing and touching. I cannot be up here preaching the word of God, which I believe is the truth. <laughs> a standard is higher than all of us. I cannot be up here preaching that word without at some point I'm gonna hit an area in you and in me that I feel deeply about. <laughs> that I kind of feel that, you know, we talked about before that like, hey preacher, what are you talking about that for? <laughs> Talk about spiritual stuff. Don't talk about my marriage. Don't talk about my thinking. Don't talk about my health. Don't talk about my money. Talk about spiritual stuff. It's just, it's just not how the Bible works. Because Jesus decides that we will have life in all areas. And so he has principles and wisdom for all areas. And so we speak about every single area. And so there is a question that we've got to ask. What will I do when I feel offended? You know, that you can be offended by... In a church setting, you can be offended by a church teaching on something that you don't agree with or you strongly disagree with, you know. It could be an offense related to church not teaching on something that you think we should be teaching on. It could be church, it could be an offense related to the person teaching from up here for various reasons. You know, it could be a number of things. But the question is so important. What will I do in life? What will I do when I get offended? Can, can my relationship handle it? Can my friendship handle it? I don't know if you've ever asked this question to your, you know, about your best friends, about the people you do life with, about your family. What will I do the day that this person offends me? You know, you get a new friend and you're like, oh, this is awesome. And it's like, oh, it's like we've known each other our whole lives. And you're doing life together and it's amazing and you're always hanging out. That's a good question to be asking. 
what will I do the day this person offends me? Because you might, you might say, that's a silly question. Why would I ask that? This is, this is amazing. This feels good. Yeah, isn't it amazing when you're in a country in summer? You can never imagine what that would look like completely covered in snow. You know, you go in Norway and it's beautiful mountains and you're like, oh, wow, this is like a tropical country. And it's like, and they're like, no, this is like, you know, Ragnarok, like in winter. It's like, it's, it's just like the, the wastelands in winter and you can't even imagine it. That's the same in our relationships. When, when everything is good and everything feels good, you can never imagine the point of offense. You can't imagine even entertaining the idea of a breakup. You can't even imagine the idea of, I'm going to walk away from this. And that is why we've said it before, choose when you're strong who you want to be when you're weak. Choose when you're strong who you want to be when you're weak. Don't wait for the challenging seasons to define you. Don't wait for the, the moments of temptation to define you. Choose before no general goes into battle without a plan. <laughs> a general doesn't walk into a, you know, a battle and go, all right, let's see how we go. Hey, you do that, and I guess, yeah, do whatever you feel like. No, you go in with a plan. You go, okay, if this happens, my response is this. If this happens, I'm going to do that. If this happens, we're going to do that. It should be the same in life. It should be the same in life. Don't just step into a moment of temptation and not have a plan. Choose when you're strong. Young people, choose in your mother's kitchen your strategy for how you're going to date. You know, choose when you're strong who you want to be when you're weak. Same in our relationship. Choose when the relationship is good. Choose when the relationship is healthy. Choose when the relationship feels good. Choose in that moment, what will my response be when this is under threat, when this is weak? One of the times that Jesus, he spoke to the people that were loyal to him, there was an offense. John chapter 6, verse 60, it says that when many heard Jesus teaching, many of his disciples, these are not strangers, these are not people just walking in on the street. These are his disciples. These are people that says, I'm in. I'm following you. These might, these might have been following him for weeks, maybe months. So his disciples says, whew, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware of this, his disciples were grumbling about this. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? And then he turned up the heat. He goes, really? If this is offend you, you're definitely going to be offended by what I'm about to say. And then he continues, and in verse 66, it says, From this time, many of his disciples turned away and no longer followed him. You don't want me to leave me too, Jesus, um, do you? Jesus asked the 12, and Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter's not saying that he wasn't offended. He's not saying that that didn't cut him as well. He didn't say that, that, you know, maybe he was wrestling with the teaching as well. But what he said was, I have chosen when I'm strong who I want to be when I'm weak. I have already decided who you are, and I'm not going anywhere. So the question is, can we avoid offense? Like, can we, can we maybe just say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to be offended? Can we avoid offense in life? That's a good question. Jesus said it like this in Luke 17, 1. He says, it is impossible that no offense should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Jesus saying, it's impossible. You cannot go through life without being offended. It will happen. So it brings us back to the question, what will we do when we get offended? Well, in order to answer that question, we first have to understand what offense is. Offense, the Greek word for offense that is, is in this ver, chap, verse here in verse Luke 17, 1. The Greek word for offense is scandalon. Scandalon. And this Greek word, scandalon, it was a common Greek word. And basically, the word is the same word that you use for when you build a trap. This is, for anyone that's 30 and under, this is a trap. This is what we used to do when we were kids, Okay. Uh, this is the stuff we used to do. Anyone ever build this when you were a kid? Come on. Okay, where are all the young people who've never seen this before, except in ancient cartoons like Disney Show? <laughs> this stick right here is a scandalon. Think of a, think of a mouse trap. That, that little thing where you put the cheese, that's a scandalon. 
This is the scandal on. And then you would put the, you would put the bait under the, the, the box. And if you took the bait, if you took the scandal on, the trap would fall. This is the scandal on. When it comes to offense, it's that we have a trap set for us. Now, when we look at that, when we're looking at this thing that's in front of us, this bait that's in front of the cheese on the trap, you know, there is a chance now to get trapped in bitterness. There is a chance to get trapped in, you know, anger, to be trapped in frustration. So the goal, obviously, we get that. The goal is not to take the bait. It's that when I feel that offense, it's not to take the bait. Do not take the bait. When, when that moment comes, it's like, Ugh, I don't like what he's saying. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand what he's saying, which is often the issue. And, and I, have a, I have a choice there. Do I take the bait or not? Do I choose to get offended? Because it is a choice. Offense is a choice. Offense is a choice. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have used the word for a trap. If it was something that just happened to you, that's not the word he would have used. You still have to choose to take the bait. Offense is a choice. So what do we do when we get offended? I, I think the first thing is that we, we do not react, we respond. We do not react, we, we respond. What's the difference between a reaction and a response? Well, a reaction acts first, and thinks later. A response thinks first and acts later. Like, just, if, if you can just remember one thing, please just remember that. Like, just take a photo of it, you know, like, whatever. Remember this in your relationships, at your workplace, in life, online, hello. Just think about this, okay? Think about this. A reaction acts first and thinks later. Like, ah! Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> a response thinks first, acts later. You see, a reaction takes a step in. A response takes a step back. It's like, oh, that hurt. What you just said, it hurt. What's your next move? Am I stepping into the bat battle or am I taking a step back? Let me just take a step back. Make some space for God's grace. <laughs> take a step back and think. Think. What, what are we thinking? Well, a response considers who said what and why. A response considers who said what and why. Who said it? Who said it? What, what's the relationship we have? Does this person even have a bridge in my life? What kind of bridge do they have in my life? Who is saying this? You know when you get offended by someone and it's like, and like sometimes people get offended by things and I'm like looking, I'm like, why are you even listening to it? Like who is that person to you? Like who is, what role does that person carry in your life? Like I don't understand why you're being offended. Like it's like a stranger says, if a stranger came up to me and offended me, it'd be like, oh yeah, that didn't feel good, but it's like, who are you? You're like, 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 you have value and you're created in the image of God or whatever, but in my life, who are you? Do you get what I'm saying? It's like, you know, in school and it's like, oh, they are saying this. Everyone, no, 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 who? Who is saying? Who is saying what and why? It's like, I can't do that because they will think, who's they? So who? First of all, when, when you feel an offense, ask the first question, who? Who said what? What are they actually saying? Like, what is it that you're being offended by? Like, what did they say? What did your wife say? What did your husband, what did the church say? What did the pastor say? What did, what did the Bible say? <laughs> what is it that you're being offended by? Is there truth to what they're saying? Is that what the offense is about? That you're just feeling threatened? And, and what, what is it? <laughs> Who said what and why? Why are they saying it? Like, what is the purpose? Are they trying to offend you? Are they trying to belittle? Are they trying to help you? Are, 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 they, are, they, are they meaning well, but it's just coming out wrong? Who said why? Who said what and why? 
Ephesians 5.14, sorry, Ephesians 4.15, it says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Why? So we can grow and become mature in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. A little while ago, I was, uh, I was hanging out with a friend, and, and suddenly he asked me a question. He says, Thomas, i got, I got a question I'll ask you. And I was like, oh, yeah, what is, what is it? He's like, it's awkward. I was like, okay. He's like, I just don't know how to say it. I've wanted to ask you for a little while. I'm like, what is it? And he's like, I just, I feel like, Thomas, you're always asking me and others, how are you? I want to ask you, how are you? And it was like the least person I expected to say it. The last person, sorry. And, and, and I was like, why, why are you saying it? So I, who? I was like, yeah, we're friends. It's all good. What are they saying? I get what they're saying. Why are you saying it? It's like, I don't know. I just feel like you've been, it seems like, like when we hang out, you've just been a little bit on autopilot. That you kind of just, you, yeah, you're going through the motions, but you're not really present. How are you? And it was just one of those, and it was a humbling conversation. And I was grateful for the conversation because it was someone that I had over the years, you know, been part of leading to Jesus. And now he was sitting and pastoring and discipling me. And we're sitting and having this conversation. And really, I, I was so grateful in the days after because it, it just showed that that conversation is what, this, you know, discipleship looks like in a Christian community. <laughs> Because Christian community is all about the strong should carry the weak. Because it's only a matter of time before the weak becomes strong and the roles are reversed. The strong should carry. Are you coming up? No, no, no. Sit down. Sit down. I'll call you up. I'll call you. We are, we are a long way from end. It just, come on. Can we give him a hand? Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Love you guys. But not yet. Who said it? Your lead pastor. What did they say? They just, he just asked you to sit down. Why? Because I love you and I respect you and I don't want you to sit up here for so long. And, you know, so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Do not take the bait. The strong should carry the weak because it's only a matter of time before the roles will be reversed. The weak will become strong. The strong will be weak for a season. And then suddenly they carry them. Truth is, we can all lose focus. We switch on autopilot, we go through the motions. And on the outside, it might look like nothing's changed, but on the inside, you become complacent. And the thing about complacency is that complacency corrupts convictions. Complacency corrupts convictions. Um, king David, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, he was a great king, and the Bible describes him as a man after God's heart. And for those who don't know the story, he wrote most of the Psalms and was one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had in their history. And, and the, 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 you know, the, he went through like a massive challenge, even becoming king. And he held on and trusted God. And finally, he became king. He ended up in the palace. He finally ended up what God had called him to be. And in short, um, there was a famous incident where while he was in the palace, there was one day he got up late from bed and he looked out from his terrace and he saw a woman uh, in one of the neighboring houses taking a bath and she was naked and he lusted after her and he commanded her to come to the palace and he slept with her and he got, his, her wife, uh, he got her husband killed in battle. The whole thing is a horrible, horrible story and, and, and a lot of pain had to happen not only in David's life but in, in the country because of this one Thing, but what led to this point of corrupted conviction? Well, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, In the spring, these are literally hours before this happened, okay? In the springtime, that's actually now, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab, so he sent his leader of the army out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the, like, the enemies, but David remained in Jerusalem. When kings ought to go off to war, David stayed home. David wasn't resting. David was complacent. And complacency corrupts convictions. We drop our guards, and we forget why we do what we do. It's really mission versus motion. I'm going through the motions. I'm in the palace. I'm a king. I'm, I'm doing the right stuff, but I'm complacent on the inside. 
I've lost track of why I do what I do. Now, listen, in, in mission, there is definitely motion. <laughs> you know, Ecclesiastes 5.3, he says, a dream comes through much activity, but a fool, he's known by his many words. You know, the fool, he just talks about, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and rah, 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 and it's like, that's awesome. But, you know, if you, if you want to build a dream, it's going to come through a lot of motion, a lot of activity. But there is a difference between habits and autopilot. There is a difference between doing what you know you should be doing and then just switching on autopilot, just doing it on routine, just becoming a professional Christian. I'm reading my Bible every day, seven out of seven. That's great. And it's like, I've been doing it all year. I'm the best Christian ever. I don't know if you are. It might be your OCD. It might not have anything to do with Jesus. You don't know if you're a good swimmer as long as you're in a river with a strong current. It's not to get out of the current that we figure out whether you're a good swimmer or not. But if you get carried by momentum, we are all great worshipers when they are up here leading worship. It's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah, but can we worship at home? It's like... Like I'm in church every Sunday, so I read my Bible at least once a week. Yeah, but do I read it at home? I love praying in church. Yeah, but do we pray at home? There's a difference. There has to be a moment where we don't just go into autopilot, but we develop habits out of our passion. When I forget why I do, what I do, what I do will destroy me. When I forget why I do, what I do, what I do, will destroy. doesn't matter how noble it is. I can, I can preach. I can lead worship. I can write sermons. I can help others. But if I've forgotten why I'm doing it, doesn't matter how noble it is what I do, it will eventually suck the life out of me. So the question we have to ask, why do we do what we do? Why do I do what I do? Ask yourself that question. Write it down. Why do I do what I do? Why am I studying this? Why am I, why am, why am I working here? Why, why did I start this business? Why, why am I at this event? Why did we get married? What, I'm not saying question the marriage. I'm saying find, refine the purpose. Refine the reason. Why am I a Christian? Why do I go to church? Why am I serving? Why am I giving? Why am I attending? Why am I praying? Why am I reading my Bible? Why do I go to a connect group? Why do I do what I do? Why am I hanging out with this person? Find the purpose. Why? Why do we do what we do? We need to ask these questions regularly in order to align, in order to realign, because in life there is drift. The Bible says, beware of the drift. Beware of the cultural drift. Beware of the religious drift. Beware of the theological drift. Beware of the relationally drift. Beware of the mental drift. Beware of the physical drift. Come on, I'm getting older, 43 this week. Beware of the drift. You gotta realign yourself. And you do that by constantly asking yourself, why do we do what we do? As an individual, why do we do what we do? As a business, why do we do what we do? As a church, why do we do what we do? Why do we do, why do I exist? Why am I doing this? Truth is, there's a lot of distractions that can take you out and that can take us away from that focus and I'm writing a sermon on distractions. I was gonna bring that today as well but then it would have been a two hour sermon and you guys would never have come up and creative team. And so I'm not gonna go there. I will be speaking that later. Uh, but I wanna just, just, just take a turn right now and because today is Heart and Soul Sunday. And I wanna just, just, just for the last few minutes together, I wanna just talk a little bit about us as a church. Why do we exist? Is that okay? Because our mission as a church is to be a healthy church changing lives through Christ. We do that through the three pillars of building healthy church communities developing purpose-filled Jesus followers and seeking to create a significant and sustainable social impact. Now, in order for us to do this, church, we must help each other to find our place in the body, which is called the church. Every single one of us, we have to ask ourselves, what is my place? Being a purpose-filled Jesus follower, it is to use what is in your hand to serve others to use what is in your hand to serve others. I'm about to, I'm just doing a disclaimer right now. One second, let me just put up the trap. (laughs) 
I'm about to put a few things on the scandal line. <laughs> Don't take the bait. <laughs> okay? Who is saying what and why? Is that okay? Who says what and why? Because purpose filled Jesus followers, they use what's in their hand to serve others. And every one of us, we've got three things in our hands. We've got time, we've got talent, and we have treasure. We have time, talent, and treasure. Ultimately, guys, you've got you to hear, hear this. And I really want you to hear every word on what I'm saying. Listen to it again next Sunday or next week when it comes online. But listen to what I'm saying. Ultimately, what I bring of my time, talent, treasure, ultimately, I don't bring it to church. I bring it to God. How I steward what's in my hand is an indicator of my relationship with God, not a relationship with my church. Now, the local church is the vehicle which we have that we operate through when it comes to time, talent, and treasure. But the reason we do it is because of God. Do, do, do you hear what I'm saying? So I, I serve in my local church. I tithe to my local church. I attend my local church. I build my local church, and I do it because of Jesus. I'm not doing it to be seen by people. I'm not doing it to get respect by people. I'm not doing it because church, I owe church or church owes me. I'm not doing it because of it. I'm doing it because I found Jesus and he found me. And I'm going, God, how can, I, in return, how can I build your kingdom? Well, build what I'm building and that is the local church. So as a Jesus follower, I ask myself, how do I use what is in my hand in order in terms of time, talent and treasure? Now, when we lose focus of that, we start making it about church, as in, I think they need it, or, you know, I want to do this, or I don't want to do that, or I feel like serving, or I don't feel like serving, and suddenly we make it about this, but really, this has got nothing to do with this. This is my responsibility, is to build this relationship with God. You know, when I get offended by someone, like if I get offended by someone in church, it's never happened. No one in our church has ever offended me. Has there been moments, maybe just once over the last 12 years, where I've gotten up on a Sunday and thought, I do not feel like preaching today? <laughs> Has there been moments? Maybe once, okay? Has there been moments where I've stood up here and, and seen faces in the crowd going, whew, this is hard. <laughs> Has there been, maybe once? <laughs> That's a lie. Been a few times. Why do I do it? Why do I keep doing it? Because I'm not doing it for you. I, I'm trying to be faithful to what I believe God has called me to do. And it's a direct response to him. Now, a part of my calling is to the benefit of you. But it's, it's a response to him. And so you offending me, I'm not saying you are. It's not you, it's someone else. Uh, it's Aarhus. Um, no, it's not. I love you guys. It's Olbo, that's why we shut it down. No, I was kidding. It's not funny. That's not funny. It's Malmö. Let's blame Malmö. Let's, sorry. It's not funny. Stop. He's like, you, well, keep offending me. It's not, it's not about that. Because it, my, my service is not in response to whether you like me or not. My service is in response to Jesus. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. I'm not Paul. But think about Paul. He got stoned, like as in proper stone, like they threw stones at him. You know, he got stoned thrown out of the town, they thought he was dead. If there was ever a time to go, I brush the dust off and move on to the next city. You know, that's biblical. Jesus said that. Move on. And Paul got up, the Bible says in Acts, and went back in. <laughs> there would have been like, when he got up the following day, still bleeding, you know, with a big black eye, you know, still a rock sticking out of his head. They'd be like, are you crazy? We don't want, like, we don't like you, Paul. Why are you still here? Oh, you, I'm not doing it for you. I'm mean, doing it to your benefit, but I'm, I'm doing it in response to Jesus. Like, and, and that's not going to change. So my response as a Jesus follower is to ask, what can I use with what is in my hand? And when we lose track of that, we start making about anything else. My responsibility as a Jesus follower is to be faithful with what's in my hand and trust God with what is in my heart. 
My responsibility as a Jesus follower is to be faithful with what's in my hand and trust God with what is in my heart. The challenge with our church, uh, to get even more practical, the challenge is that our strength is also our potential weakness. We're like a duck on water. Have you ever seen a duck on water? It's like when a duck swims, it's like on the surface, it's just cool, calm, and collected. You know, it's just... You know, like it's just cool, calm, and collected. But under the surface, it's like, you know, it's like over time. You know, those little legs are just over time. And church can be like that. We can be a little bit like that. It's a strength, but it's also our weakness. Because you can look around and go, we're good. We don't need more volunteers. We don't need more team. We're in a good building. We don't need more finances. We've got it all. Like there's no need. But beneath the surface, you suddenly realize there is needs, not only to where we are now, but needs to where we want to go in terms of the mission and the vision of where we're seeing our church going. But we don't want to be a needs-driven church. We're never going to be up here going, here's an electricity bill, who wants to cover that? (laughs) You know, we don't want to be up here like that. And, you know, we want to be vision-driven. We want to be mission-driven. We want to build with people whose hearts are stirred. So as a church, I'm just like, let's reset. Let's restart in our thinking. Let's get back to the basic. Let's get back to the source and ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? Because if we want to do this or be that, what we believe we're called to, each of us must carry our part. Each of us. In Acts chapter 2, um, how long have I got left? I've got a few minutes, guys. Just hang on, okay? It's heart and soul. We're good. You know, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, it's important to note, it says they devoted themselves, okay? It was a personal, individual choice. Everyone was filled with awe. The many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple because they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Church, the moment we think we've arrived, we become complacent. And complacency corrupts convictions. As a church, we have so many things to be grateful for. Like, seriously, so many things. I think about our church, and I'm like, I cannot believe we get to do this. And I I generally mean that. Every week, we see people connecting with Jesus. Every week, last Sunday, I had someone come in, a teacher come up to me Sunday night, say, sorry, are you the the priest? I said, yeah, I'm I'm the priest. And, and, And they go, hey, I'm sorry, but I brought my gymnasium class here today. Is that okay? I was like, no, get out. No, I didn't say that. I said, yeah, of course. And they're like, I was like, why are you here? And they're like, oh, they've been begging me all week if we can come to Hillsong. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that's amazing. Come on in. And then seeing Sunday night, seeing them connecting with Jesus, hearing them as they're walking out going, it's pretty it's good, eh? You know, you know, as teenagers they do, and, which is a huge compliment. It's almost like getting a compliment for someone from Jutland. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're seeing this amazing thing that God is doing. You're seeing people getting touched. You're seeing encounters with God. You're seeing healings. You're seeing... Things are getting, relationships getting restored, people getting help, but there's also reality under the surface. And the reality under the surface when it comes to the heart and soul that I want to talk to you about are these three areas. It's time, talent, and treasure. The time, it's about people putting their hands up and joining a team to serve, whether it's a coffee team or welcome team or a city care team, whether it's, you know, whatever team it might be, just saying, hey, I've got time. I want to be part of the kids' ministry. I want to be part of the youth ministry. I want to help carry it's, it's us saying, what, is, what do I have available of time? It's talent. Talent is about people bringing their talent to the table. It's saying, hey, I'm a photographer. Hey, I'm a lawyer. Hey, I'm an accountant. Hey, I'm a videographer. Hey, I'm a sound engineer. I'm a musician. I am a, I'm a whatever it is that you are good at. I'm a whiz at Excel. Yesterday in Aarhu, someone said, hey, I'm a programmer. Can you use me? You know, whatever it is that you have of talent, of saying, well, I don't know, I, 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 I don't really know how this fits in, but I just want to let you know this is what I have. You know, it's, it's it, people saying that. And then the last thing is treasure. Treasure is about getting a revelation in terms of my finances, that I bring my tithe. That's the first 10% of my income. I bring that as a fruit of my income. I bring that to my local house, the local church. Malachi 3.10 gives us the reason why we do this. 
bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that's the local church, that there might be food in my house. It, it is the, it is the God-given mechanism, financial mechanism that we got given as a local church so that local churches don't have to be relying on a government, don't have to be relying on policies, don't have to keep everyone else happy, don't have to do all these different things, but can say, no, as a local church, we take care of our own. We build our church together. I bring my tithes so there might be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing there will not be room enough to contain it. We are... I'm not saying this to brag. I'm not saying this to anyone. I'm just saying it. It's a fact. We're one of the biggest churches in the country. We, we, we're seeing incredible favor as a church. On, on small level, on big level, we, we have got some amazing doors that are opening up at the moment. I cannot wait to share it with you in the future. But if we don't as a community decide to carry this together, all of us, at some point we have to make some decisions of what we can do as a church. I love that we're in this building. I really do. I think this building serves us well. It's in the middle of the city. Well, it's in the middle of Flexbow. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great location. Our kids have great facilities. We, we dream of a, of a building in the future. But the truth is, as a church, we're actually up in terms of attendance. We have more people coming to church than last year. It's incredible. People coming to church, they're finding Jesus. It's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. That deserves a clap. God is good and he's faithful. But the reality is as well, at the same time, and this might come as a shock, we are about 30% down in our finances compared to last year. 30%. And you might go, well, how much is that and you know, how significant is it? Well, it's, it's, it is significant enough that we've got to look around at our buildings, we've got to look around at what we do and go, okay, well, this is obviously not sustainable like this. So at some point, if this continues, we've got to change how we do church. We've got to change some of the things. And if we stay at this level, mainly the finances, but also volunteers, you know, we've got to make some calls in terms of the expression. And I was thinking about this. Um, now you can come, the team. Sorry. I just didn't want you playing while I'm talking about 30% down because it's, it would sound like I'm manipulating. And I, I, that's, that's not what I'm after. And so is that okay? So now you can play. Um, but I was thinking about this in, in terms of convictions as a church. And I'm going to go super practical. One of the things I said when we first started church, I don't make many calls as in, I want this. I make a few, but not many. One of the things I've always said, and if you're a foreigner and you're not from Denmark, this might not make any sense to you, but I always said as a church, I didn't really want to go after tips and lots of middle of. Uh, if, if you don't understand what I'm saying, it's just that in Denmark, every organization, church, religious, non-religious, they can apply for um, like gambling money, basically. <laughs> And I always felt awkward about it. You, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay. Like, it's, I ha we have every right to. It's not as if it's like we're breaking. Like, it, it, every, every time I talk to people, and pastors as well, saying we don't do that, they're like, why? It's an easy half a million. It's an easy 250,000. And I've always been like, it just feels awkward as a local church to be applying for gambling money. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it feels like is that, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, that just feels awkward. So from the beginning, I was always like, let's not do it. And then this year, we're looking at the finances, and now we're having real conversations because we've got to steward the church. And we're sitting there, and we're having these conversations about, well, I don't know, should we? I mean, we have every right to. Should we do it? Um, should we apply for, I don't know, some foundations and get some finances in? Should we, should we look at, and you know, I'm sitting in these meetings, and they're important meetings. We need to have these meetings. I, I'm just being, heart and soul is also about my heart and soul. Is that okay? And I'm sitting there in these meetings and I just think, because we spend hours on these conversations, put it together, days, just this year. And I'm sitting in these meetings going, man, I wish we could just be talking about discipleship instead. I wish that all the people in this room talking about this could be out meeting with new Christians instead. I wish that I could be somewhere else right now. <laughs> I wish that I could be out talking to someone who's just found Jesus. I wish we could be sitting and, and, and coming up with ideas of how we can get the Easter message out. I wish we could be sitting and brainstorming of, of how we could build more for our youth. I wish we could sit and be going, hey, we've got these extra finances. Let's, let's start up youth meetings and let's start up regular things for the kids and let's do things for the parents. And I wish 
we could do that. But the fact is, this is our reality right now. But I believe, I don't believe that the answer to a local church is in our government. I don't believe that. Now, right now, it's kind of okay because of the country we're in, but we cannot assume that that's going to be forever. I don't believe the answer to a local church is found in the government. I don't believe the answer to a local church's finances is found in foundations. We'll receive it, but that's not where we, the answer is. Jesus tells a story in Luke 15, verse 8. He says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice, I have found the coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is about lost souls. This is about people who've walked away and lost their way. But the principle is there as well. When she lost the coin, she didn't go over to the neighbor and say, excuse me, I just lost the coin. Can I have one of yours? She didn't go to the other neighbor and say, excuse me, I lost my coin. Could I borrow one from you? She didn't go to the government and say, excuse me, I lost my coin. Is there any way I can get insurance for that? Like, it, how does this work? No, what did she do? She swept the house. She swept the house. The answer was in the house. Her answer was in the house. And I, I believe as a church, the church of our size, the church of our age, the church of our level of maturity, I think the answer to our church is not found in government. I don't think the answer is found in surplus of gambling in Denmark. I don't think the answer to our church is found outside of these four walls. I think the answer to our church is found in us. It is a matter of lighting the lamp, sweeping the house, and searching carefully. We have cut everything down to the bone this year for our church. But the miracle is found in the house. The answer is found in the house. The provision is in the house. It goes for business. This goes for life. If you are in a business and you've lost the spark, if you're in a business and you've lost that creative idea, can I encourage you, don't let your first response be an outside consultant or an outside coach or an outside whatever. Sweep the house. First look in, start sweeping the house, light the lamp and search carefully. Wherever we read about great leaders in the Bible, wherever we read about people that done great things for the kingdom, there was always people whose hearts were stirred, whose hearts were stirred that brought provision, that brought their time, that brought their talent, that brought their treasure. Wherever we had an Abraham, a Moses, a Joshua, a David, a Solomon, a Ruth, a Nehemiah, a Peter, a Paul, and even Jesus, there were people alongside them who brought provision for the vision. I want to talk about how to get involved. I want to talk about why to get involved. And I want to talk about what it does in us to be involved. To consider what will I do with my time, talent, and treasure. Listen, we don't get saved by what we do. But God uses what we do in our saving. Just think about that for a second. We don't get saved by what we do. It's worthy as the lamb. We talked about it last week. That's what saves us. But God uses what we do in our saving because he transforms us. He builds our character. He disciples us. Listen, I'm up for every discussion. Should I go down in time so that we can put on a youth pastor? I'm up for the talk. Should, we, should I, me and Kat, go down in time so we can start regular youth meetings? And I'll figure that out. Is that, is that the conversation we should have? Cool. Should we change the venue? I'm up for every discussion. I don't care. Like We, we can have the conversation. Let's talk about it. But at the same time, I want us to be about the mission. I want us to be about the mission. I'm unapologetic about this. Because I'm not trying to manipulate anyone here today. But I'm not even begging you. And I'm not, you know, on my knees saying, please give, please, you know, serve, whatever. I'm trying to say what David said when he faced Goliath. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for why we exist? I'm trying to say what Jesus said when facing Goliath. For this cause, I was born. For this reason, we exist. We're not going to be a church that just goes through the motions. We're not going to be a church that just skits through it. No, we are going to be about the mission. Jesus called us and He says, go into the highways, go into the byways, tell everybody the King is on His way. That is our mission. And whatever we need to do and whatever awkward conversations we're going to have, we're going to have those conversations so we can stop sitting around talking about these things and we can get out the, through the door and start discipling every single person, baptizing them in the name of Jesus so they can become followers of Jesus Christ. That is why we exist. That is why we were born. That is what we're going to be about. And that is our mission to build a healthy church, changing lives through Christ. That is our mission. 
And so the call is out there for every single one of you who call Hillsong Church, or if you know call Hillsong Church, the call is out there to you as well. Get on the link tomorrow night. Let's talk about this and consider for yourself, what will my response be? What will my response be this year? And let's carry this together. This is not my church. This is our church. It's God's church, but it's our church. Let's carry this together and let's get out there and let's get on with the mission. You might be sitting here and if, you're, if it's your first time here today, and I will finish, this is me finishing, sorry. I've, I've tried to land the plane five times. There's a little bit of turbulence so we had to get up again, but I'm landing it now. But you might be sitting here, as a, you know, if you're a guest here today and you go, I don't understand, isn't God God? Why does he need me? Well, that's the thing, he doesn't need you. He doesn't need you, he doesn't need my money. He doesn't need me, he wants me. Can't God build his church? Yeah, he can, absolutely. It's a bit like if you are a parent and you ask your children, you know, hey, could you help me with this? It's like, oh, you know, you know when your kids, they're like, yeah. And then as a dad, you're like, oh, because you know it's going to take longer, it's going to be more complicated, they're going to make mistakes. You're like, oh, I, I could have done so much quicker on my own. <laughs> so why do I include them? Because of the relationship. I don't need them. I want them. You know, they, you know, especially when, they, when they're older, they don't care. That, you know, no! <laughs> but when they're younger, they're still like, they put on their gloves and they're like, Daddy needs me. You know, and the other one's like, yeah, Daddy does need you. And you're kind of like, oh, and you're trying to lift something and trying to make them feel like they're lifting as well. And, you know, and, but you know, I don't need them, but I want them. God invites us in. And it's really, when it comes to building church, when it comes to our walk with Jesus, when it comes to us being purposeful, Jesus follow us. It's not that I have to. It's not that he needs me. It's that I get to. I, I, I get to make my life matter. That my life, it's about more than just getting up, going to bed, going through the rhythm, going through the monotonous living. No, no, there is a reason I'm alive. And part of our calling as a church is to help every single one of you to discover what is your purpose. Why did God make you the way he made you? He didn't make you one way in order to use you another way. He gave you the ability to design. He gave you the ability to build. He gave you the ability to create music. He gave you the ability to see colors. He gave you the ability to communicate. He gave you the ability to see pictures. He gave you the ability to serve. He gave you the ability to have empathy. Why? That's a cool journey to go on. Why did he give you that ability? God is so interested in every single one of our lives. Yeah. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. And so as we finish, I want to just pray for anyone here that you've never seen Jesus like this. For you, God has been like this distant, dormant, and disinterested God that has no reason for being involved in my life. But now you're kind of like, wait, what? His eyes are on me? Well, you're looking at me? You love me, but don't you know my life? Don't you know everything I've done wrong? Worthy is the lamb. He loves me because of who he is, not because of what I've done. And I want to pray for anyone here that you don't know Jesus like this. Open your life up to Jesus. Open up your life to God and discover your purpose. Could I get everyone to close your eyes and bow your heads and just to give everyone a moment of privacy? If you're here today and, Tom, and you're saying, Thomas, I don't know Jesus like this, but I want to. I want to get to know Jesus the way you're talking about him right now. Could you pray for me? Could you include me in a prayer? I'm just going to count to three. And when I get to three, I want every person who says, that's me. I want to say yes to Jesus. Include me in this prayer. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, just quickly, when I say three, just lift your hand so I know who I'm praying with. Are you ready? One, two. Three, just lift your hands all over this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All you guys there, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Beautiful, thank you, all the way over there. Couples lifting their hands together, beautiful. Thank you. So good, so good, so good, so good. Thank you. Beautiful, you can put your hands down. Let's say a prayer together. I'm just gonna say it just line by line, but I really wanna encourage those of you who lifted your hand for the first, you know, lifted your hand, or maybe you didn't, but you know you should have. This is for you, but we are all gonna pray it, okay? 
So come on, just repeat after me. Just say, Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. I'm sorry for my mistakes. I'm sorry for my sin. But today I choose you. Give me Jesus. From today, I am forgiven. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I am free. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we congratulate? Come on, really celebrate every person making that decision. So good. So good, so good, so good, so good. So good. Hey, if you lifted your hand, congratulations. We want to give you a, a gift. It's a Bible. It's just a New Testament Bible, which is just the, the story in the Bible after Jesus came, okay? And uh, it's a good place to start. And so on the way out, our, our team is there ready to, ha- to give you a Bible. So just on the way out, grab a Bible and start to read it. Start to get to know Jesus for yourself. And then just keep coming back. Keep finding yourself in community, aligning and realigning in terms of what you believe in your life. Amen? I mean, can we stand to our feet? We're going to say one more prayer, and then we're going we're gonna to head on out. Obviously, if, if, um, you know, if you want to respond to this earlier, this whole call to action, come and talk to us. Come and talk to George Kamara or George Item or myself. And, you know, just come and say, hey, uh, straight away, I want to get involved. How do, what do I do? Let's pray for one another. Amen. And let's believe the best days are still ahead of us. Amen. Like, seriously, like, how good is God? <laughs> We're talking about money and percentages and whatever. And in the middle of that, people across the room are finding Jesus. Like God is so good. He's so, so good. If you will, will you grab the hands of the person next to you? Jesus, I just thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord God. Lord, we just commit ourselves to you. Everything we have, everything we are, we give it to you. We thank you, Lord God, that we get to be involved with your kingdom. Lord, we lay our lives down on the altar, Lord Jesus, and I pray this week, use us in any way you can. Open doors that no man can shut, shut doors that no man should open. Lord, we lift up our friends, family members. We're so happy people finding Jesus, but we want our loved ones to find Jesus too. So we lift them up to you, Lord God, and we ask, draw their hearts to you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you are good God and you do good things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And if you believe it, can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank Jesus for his goodness in our lives? We really hope that that encouraged and blessed you. If you made a decision for Jesus, a massive congratulations from us. We would love to be in contact with you, send you a Bible and connect you to a local church. So just below in the details of this episode, there's different ways to contact us. I can encourage you to reach out so that we can help you. Obviously, if you live anywhere near one of our physical locations, we really hope to see you in person very soon. There is nothing like being in the room. Can I also encourage you, if this blessed you, why don't you share this with friends and you know, make sure you pass it on to them as well. Make sure to click, click subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode we send out. God bless you.